Rabble Podcast Network Show. New voices in your head. It's Radio Free Radio. You're listening to Red Eye on Vancouver Cooperative Radio, CFRO 102.7. An adolescent girl exhibits difficulties in school and social circumstances. The adults in her life, teachers, principals, and social workers, don't know how, don't have the resources, or are simply unwilling to deal with her in constructive ways. She's seen as a child with behavioral difficulties, and the adults discipline her. Several years later, on October 18, 2007, at the age of 19, In an isolation cell at an adult prison for women in Ontario, Ashley Smith strangles herself to death. Several prison officials watch. They have been ordered not to intervene. Last week, Canada's correctional investigator, Howard Sapers, released his report into the circumstances surrounding Ashley's death. I'm joined on the line now by Kim Pate. She's Executive Director of the Canadian Association of of Elizabeth Fry Societies, an organization that advocates for women and girls in the justice system. Kim joins us from Ontario. Hello, Kim. Good morning. Now, you were involved in Ashley's case before her death. What was the nature of your relationship with her? Well, I think probably the best description would be her advocate. Um, As part of my responsibility as the National Director, I visit all of the federal prisons for women where women are serving two years or more and visit women throughout those prisons, do a walk through the entire prison, meet with the organized groups, and then also meet with the administration to address issues. And so the way that I first met Ashley was on, um, actually the first, the way that I first tried to meet Ashley was on one of those visits. I was denied access the first time, and we now know that uh, it was after she had been assaulted or allegedly assaulted by a staff member. And I had some lawyers with me, but we were not allowed access. And then subsequently, I was able to gain access when she was moved to another prison because of how it's safer, as has documented, in 11 and a half months, she was moved 17 times. So it was sometimes difficult to figure out exactly where she was, but I was... The initial contact I had with her was attempting to investigate uh, allegations of four different assaults on her by staff members. Can you give us a little bit of background on her and how she ended up uh, in jail? Well, she, the, the information at the time I didn't know, but uh, since her death I found out that she was first jailed um, as a young person you know, in, um, in a youth jail. And she was jailed um, as a result of a breach of probation after she'd been placed on probation following what many people have described as the crab apple um, throwing incident. She lived on a street where she um, was advised by some of her neighbors who were on social assistance that the the postal worker routinely delivered the checks um, late. And a theme that became one that I came to know about Ashley was that when she saw or perceived there was injustice, she took it upon herself to try and alleviate that injustice in whatever way she felt appropriate. And in this context, she was throwing crowd apples at the postal delivery person because she believed that um, he was purposely delivering the, the, the welfare checks late so that that would disadvantage the people who were on assistance. And that's what led to her having an assault charge, and then she uh, was on probation for that, breach probation, and she was jailed. And while she was jailed awaiting the appearance in court on that breach of probation, she accumulated more charges, and in fact that became the pattern, not just for Ashley, but many, then far too many women and young people and men in the system who, particularly if they have mental health issues, will accumulate charges while they're in custody, and so what started out as a breach of probation likely would not have resulted in a custodial sentence. By the time she went to court, she had several other charges and was then... Um, then received a short custodial term and then continued to receive charges and was kept in isolation virtually the entire time that she was in the youth custody facility. Then she was transferred to the adult system and she was briefly in the provincial jail system for about a month and was also kept in isolation there, was tasered there several times was, um, and then was transferred into the adult system where she was kept in segregation the entire time. and 
the last time I saw her had absolutely nothing in her cell and it had been in that condition for some time. So w why was she put in, in, in segregation? I guess that's what we think of as uh, solitary confinement. Yes. Um, well, the, the travesty is that even staff members, and there are many staff members who disagree with um, the treatment of Ashley and others, but one of the difficulties is that when she was in, um, in custody and has mental health issues, the easiest way for the system to manage those mental health issues in their mind is to keep the person isolated and under camera supervision. And so many people with mental health issues end up in housing those conditions of confinement. And um, she was one of them. And while she was in those conditions, her mental health issues were exacerbated. It happens to most people in the, who are housed in isolation. If they didn't have mental health issues when they started, they often develop them in those conditions. Well, I was going to say, I mean, if you imagine being in a cell with no stimulation whatsoever, it's going to give anybody problems. Yes, and that, that's exactly what happened to Ashley, in my opinion, and, and certainly more importantly in the opinion of those who have expertise in areas of mental health. But basically, she um, she began to, as the the psychologists and psychiatrists refer to, as decompensating. But as you know, in that context, most people want more human contact. And perversely, what happens in the prison setting is they get less and less human contact, fewer and fewer things to do. And so she ended up with a situation where she had no um, nothing in herself, nothing to do, um, and was you know isolated and started started you know self injuring and that's again not uncommon and the the manner that she most commonly self injured was by choking herself and she described doing that sometimes just to feel something sometimes because she was cold and wanted to go to sleep and sometimes um, because she was just bored and so it became something that she did routinely and my, our understanding now, again, we didn't know this at the time, was that staff had been advised not to intervene. In one case, we were told that it was until she turned blue. In other circumstances, they were told not to intervene until she wasn't moving. And what we know is that in medical, um, people with medical expertise have said that by the time someone's blue and not moving, they could be dead. And clearly, that was what happened in this case.